Join us as we take you through an incredible journey of crafting a pulse plasma thruster. A pulsed plasma thruster places a block of polytetrafluoroethylene, what we know as Teflon, between a pair of metal plates. Then, connected wires charge up those plates with electricity until it arcs through the Teflon block, set off by a spark plug. That arc delivers thousands of volts into the block, vaporizing the nearby Teflon and ionizing it into a plasma. The sudden burst of plasma effectively creates a circuit connecting the metal plates, which allows electricity to flow like it's traveling through a wire. While researching pulse plasma thrusters, we stumbled upon applied iron systems. Their website documents Michael Pretty's impressive work on electric thrusters. What sets it apart is the open source access it offers to design files and comprehensive performance reports. If you take a look at their gallery, one can also find the schematics of the circuits used. Keeping this design as reference, we got to work. So here's the plan. Power is supplied to a driving circuit which then powers up a voltage multiplier. The entire circuit undergoes pulse modulation which effectively charges and discharges the energy storage units which are basically capacitors. These capacitors are then connected to the thruster's electrodes. To measure the efficiency or performance of the thruster, there is a thrust measurement system in place. The real test unfolds inside a vacuum chamber where we simulate the void of space and put our thruster through the test. In our immediate quest for high voltage, we turn to what was easily accessible, a mosquito racket generating a handy 1000 to 3000 volts. Its voltage, though impressive, just wasn't enough for the task at hand. We then came across Cockroft Voltage Generator, a renowned voltage multiplier. Featuring a ladder pattern of capacitors and diodes, it converts AC into powerful DC. Its design allows for stacking stages, amplifying the output voltage with each added stage. After acquiring a set of high voltage capacitors, we proceeded to assemble a 3 stage multiplier using 102 picofarad capacitors rated at 1 kV. We then powered it using the typical household voltage of 230V AC in India, but the circuit disappointingly yielded very few sparks. It then occurred to us to merge the Cockroft voltage generator with the Mosquito BAT circuit, albeit with some modifications. In the original BAT circuit, AC supply is converted to DC and stored in a battery. When the button is pressed, this battery discharges DC current which in turn runs through an oscillator to provide high frequency AC. This is then amplified using a step-up transformer and rectified to DC using diodes to power the mesh. Our approach involved bypassing the diodes and feeding the high voltage AC output directly into the Cockroft voltage generator's input with the goal of achieving an even higher output voltage. We removed the circuit from the breadboard and soldered it to a power port to avoid potential current leakage. While the results were promising, our thirst for power was not yet quenched. Next up, our eyes caught a DC-DC converter and step-up transformer module boasting a remarkable 400kV output from a humble 3 to 6 volt input. Though that seemed too good to be true, we decided to test it out. We tested the module by powering it with 5V Arduino supply. Subsequently, we placed a block of Teflon between two plates firmly linked to the DC-DC converter's terminals. This provided us with some interesting footage. Having obtained promising results, the next step was to transfer our experiment into a vacuum chamber. Five years ago, Action Lab introduced an exciting build-your-own vacuum chamber kit. This kit included a range of components such as one-way valves, a syringe, tubes, and a jar for conducting a variety of fascinating experiments. With the desire to preserve the original vacuum jar, we acquired a glass jar, added a valve for vacuum creation and inserted wires through the cap for powering the thruster. As we observed the balloon inflating while removing air, the tube eventually buckled, preventing further progress. Realizing the limitation, we decided to enhance our setup. To achieve this, we acquired a 14 watt vacuum pump from Roku.in. As we powered on the vacuum pump, the balloon inflated in a matter of seconds. Before creating vacuum, we observed the electrical arcing. Once the vacuum is established, we could see the corona discharge inside the jar, but it didn't appear to ablate any of the Teflon. These mini generators provided high voltage in short bursts, but weren't suitable for sustained high voltage output. We also couldn't see what was inside them because it was sealed with epoxy to prevent arcing between components. We then came across a YouTube video where Nia dissects one of these. 
he submerges the converter and acetone to weaken the epoxy. After setting it aside for 4 days, the epoxy breaks down. It was at this point that we observed that a flyback transformer was used for high voltage delivery. He even attempts to break down the circuit involved. While searching for flyback transformers, we found a video by Plasma Channel in which he manages to generate 15,000 volts resulting in larger arcs that sustain for an extended period. Flyback transformers were commonly used in old cathode ray TVs to excite the filament for producing picture. Typically driven by a MOSFET, this transformer operates by creating a magnetic field in the primary coil when the transistor is turned on. When the switch turns off, the magnetic field in the primary coil collapses which then induces a high voltage AC in the secondary coil. It is then rectified using diodes, resulting in a high voltage DC output. However, the transformers we managed to get our hands on didn't come with a data sheet, making it a bit of a puzzle to figure out the primary coil pin connections. The pins could be this, or this, or any of the other 26 combinations. A quick workaround would be to wind the primary coil around the magnet and connect those ends to the driver. Here, we have a 220 ohm resistor and a MOSFET connected to the transformer as the driver. Though it's not quite what we expected, the narrow electrical discharges confirm that we were on the right track. Our next step is to find an improved driver that can fully harness the potential of this transformer. Next up is another widely used driver for flyback transformers, the ZVS circuit. This circuit efficiently operates a flyback transformer by precisely switching power transistors on and off at zero voltage points. After dedicating hours to solving the circuit, the moment of truth arrived. Yet, unlike our previous attempts that yielded decent sparks, this one didn't produce any, leaving us perplexed as to where we went wrong. We weren't sure if it was the transformer that didn't work or the driver itself. After a series of frustrating tests, we decided to purchase an old TV from an e-waste recycling store for 300 rupees, expecting it to contain a working flyback transformer. And boy were we relieved to find one inside. We carefully dismantled the circuit and got to desoldering, which was an absolute pain without a heat gun. We also discovered a more suitable off-the-shelf driver for the transformer called a ballast. Ballasts are commonly used in tube lights to excite the gas within the tube. They convert low frequency AC supply into high frequency AC output. This high frequency AC can then be fed into the primary coil of the transformer resulting in generation of high voltage DC arcs. After a few trials of finding the primary coil pins, we were able to get some beautiful arcs out of the transformer. We conducted further tests with other transformers we have, and most of them perform admirably well with this setup. When it came to updating Teflon, flyback transformers were more effective compared to the DC DC boost converters. We weren't ready to abandon the ZVU circuit just yet given its advantage of accepting a DC input unlike the ballast which requires AC. At first it seemed promising, but after conducting a few tests, the ZBS circuit started showing signs of inconsistency and reliability concerns. Ultimately, we made the decision to finalize our driver as the ballast. Already having burnt the multimeter, we built the circuit to measure the high voltage. However, with arcs parking between the resistors, we settled for an estimated 15 kV reading. With our multipliers and driving circuit ready, the next step in our journey was to focus on the energy storage units. We began our testing with disk ceramic capacitors. The total capacitance of only 0.04 microfarads at 12 kV, they lacked sufficient storage capacity and provided only instantaneous supply. A similar outcome occurred when we tested silver mica capacitors which had a total capacitance of 0.0011 microfarads at 10 kV, again resulting in instantaneous energy release without storage. However, we tested polypropylene capacitors with a total voltage rating of 8 kV and a capacitance of 0.5 microfarads. We struck gold. They had the ability to store voltage for a longer duration, allowing us to discharge them manually as needed. But we did need to epoxy our capacitor unit to prevent arcing between the terminals of solder. With the capacitors ready, it was time to move on to the heart of the project, the thruster itself. So here's how the thruster comes together. We have three metal plates stacked 
with insulating Teflon blocks placed between them. The bottom plate serves as the anode or ground. Above it, there's a spacer made of Teflon to separate the anode from the spark igniter. On top of this, there's another Teflon block which acts as the fuel. Finally, we have our primary ignition cathode at the top. A through hole is present in the center of all the plates. When the circuit is activated, a spark is generated between the anode and the spark igniter plate. This spark ionizes the nearby environment, making it conductive for a subsequent arc to be formed between the cathode and the anode. This results in the ablation of Teflon fuel sheet. The ablated Teflon particles are then accelerated towards the exit due to the electric and magnetic fields generated by the plates, producing a propulsive pulse. Over time, Teflon erodes. It was time to prepare the Teflon blocks. After cutting and drilling a few holes, the fuel and insulator blocks were ready. We also cut and drilled aluminum plates to the required dimensions. After experimenting with the thickness of the blocks, we reached this configuration. We found it necessary to insulate the plates to prevent arcing from the sharp edges where arcs travel sideways from one plate to another instead of through the Teflon block for ablation. Here's an overview of what's taking place. We employ one transformer to supply the main voltage to the cathode capacitor. There's an additional transformer solely for producing the spark between the spark igniter plate and the anode. Switching frequency of charging the primary and the spark igniter is managed by an Arduino paired with a relay which is in turn connected to the palace. As the capacitor charges up, the spark igniter initiates an arc. This triggers the main discharge leading to the ablation of Teflon. It was time to gauge the actual thrust our setup produced. Drawing inspiration from Michael Brady's measurement system, we adopted a method using a simple pendulum mechanism. By attaching a strip of capital tape to a wire connected to the stand, the angle of displacement caused by the thrust can be observed. Using this angle and knowing the properties of our pendulum, we can determine the impulse width using this equation. Impulse width provides a measure of the cumulative effect of the thrust over a short duration that is measured in Newton seconds. We switched from aluminum to copper plates for their superior heat dissipation and reduced resistive losses, boosting system performance and longevity. To address this, we incorporated an additional capacitor for the spark igniter rather than connecting the transformer directly for sparking. Once everything was wired up, this happened. The plates are positioned too far apart, causing the capacitor to overload and explode. Anyway, after replacing the capacitor stack, we managed to get things operational. With the thruster now refined, our next step was crafting a bolt to house the integral circuit components. We placed the components on the wooden slab and screwed them in. Given our limited space for the thrust measurement system and our intention to prevent any wires from interfering with the thruster, we crafted a design that ensures ample clearance for the full range of motion for the captain tape. This is what we have so far. While we were working on the thruster, we had simultaneous work going on the vacuum chamber as well. So we designed a vacuum chamber, not too big, not too small. It has a volume of 15,000 cubic centimeters. It is equipped with valves for connecting to a vacuum pump and a vacuum gauge to monitor the internal pressure. Additionally, it features electrical feed-throughs for supplying voltage within the chamber. After getting everything required to make one, we started working on the chamber. The gasket maker we used seemed to not cure properly within the confines of the vacuum chamber. It's possible that the lack of air circulation inside the chamber affected its drying process. Consequently, we removed the gasket and opted to test the chamber using leather strips as a seal on the edges. Then using this pump that operates at 180 watts, 1440 rpm, we tested the vacuum chamber. Unfortunately, it didn't achieve the desired suction because we didn't have a proper seal. Next, we introduced a sheet of polyethylene foam lying around typically used in packaging. It worked once before we recorded the video and then stopped working. We guess prolonged exposure to vacuum conditions might have degraded the polyethylene foam over time. What do we do next? We reinforced it with one more to just see if the vacuum chamber works. Well, it did work. While this temporary solution was successful in creating a stronger vacuum, the chamber wasn't prepared for such a pressure load. 
In this configuration, the glass panes on the left and right lacked corner support, making it vulnerable to the applied pressure. This uneven force distribution caused the side panes to implode when the pump was turned on. Thinking about it, we should have probably done a simulation before we got to making one. Anyways, with a better design which ensures a more uniform distribution of pressure on the corners, we got to building it. The chamber worked with the same ceiling, but we knew that we needed a better solution. We started with glass putty, which never dried even after 6 days. It was also very hard to separate the top from the bottom. After somehow managing to remove the seal, we decided to use some good old clay to seal our chamber. While this chamber worked perfectly, we could hear cracks of glass at 50% vacuum and we didn't want to risk imploding another vacuum chamber. We shifted to a cylindrical acrylic design for the vacuum chamber, providing optimal evenness and pressure distribution. We began with an aluminum plate and got it cut as per our required dimension. We then polished and machined the aluminum plates to accommodate valve holes and legs for a stand. We also got a wooded slab cut to insulate the circuit from the aluminum base. We sourced acrylic plates and tubes to construct the chamber's body. This one has a volume of 30,000 cubic centimeters. Now to test the chamber. We were able to achieve only about 66% vacuum using the current vacuum pump. So we went to another lab to get a more powerful one to see how much we can push our vacuum chamber to. Using this vacuum pump, we were able to reach 83% vacuum and eventually also pushed it to 95.26%. Not gonna lie, it was a messy process with the clay. With the vacuum chamber ready, it was time to integrate the circuit in there. Well, how did we not see that coming? We believe there was a significant power variance between the power at the university and the household supply. We removed the chamber and tested just the circuit. Upon investigating it, turned out that the relay wasn't working. After replacing it, it was time for the final test. Now with everything ready, we observed the thruster at different vacuum levels. Near vacuum, the thruster's impulse is barely audible, but the characteristics of vacuum itself becomes remarkably apparent and visually impressive. A vacuum level of 95.26%, our results showed an impulse bit of 2.396 micronewton seconds. To put that in perspective, that's how much one tenth of a mosquito would weigh on your hand. While PPTs can't match the high velocities of chemical rockets, they shine in tasks like station keeping and minor orbit corrections due to their compact and precise nature. And there we have it, a comprehensive look into the creation of an affordable pulse plasma thruster. While the thruster's size isn't quite as compact as we hoped, it was the best we could do with the given resources. We're grateful for your interest and time dedicated in joining us on this journey. Thanks for watching.